All of our previous examples required the file search class to be notified that it should call listeners when something interesting happened, like when a file was found. What if you want some sort of loosely coupled situation? You want to broadcast that something interesting has happened, and if some code happens to be listening, it can react, much like the radio. You know, when you want to listen to the radio, you don't have to tell the radio station that you're there. They just broadcast. And if you happen to be listening to that station at the right time, you get notified of some important thing that happened. That's the basis of events. If something interesting happens, the class broadcasts to the world that something has happened, and you can happen to be listening for that event and react to it if it does. Now, it's not quite like the radio. Because in a .NET world, there's a common place where each class will broadcast information about the event, and there's a common place where you will go and listen for that event. Now, that's all hidden from you. You don't have to think about it. They broadcast, you subscribe, and you can know when the event has occurred. Classes can set themselves up so that they can react to notifications from classes that are raising events without having to tell the class that's broadcasting the information. On the other hand, .NET does know who's listening. Remember, the concept of the hitching post applies here. That is, the class that's raising an event hitches up to this hitching post to notify .NET when something happens, and you as a listener have hitched up to that hitching post to tell .NET that you want to be notified when that thing happens. There's a little corner of .NET in there that handles this, receives notifications, and tells you that that event has occurred. So .NET does know who's listening for each event. The file search class can raise an event when it finds a file, and listeners can react to that event. Ostensibly, this works the same as it might have in VB6, if you worked with VB6. Under the covers, it's all delegates. If you want to work with events, you can do things just like you might have in VB6. That is, declare an event using the event keyword, raise the event using the raise event keyword, and trap the event using the with events keyword applied to a variable of the correct type. In VB.NET, you can use the handles clause to link an event to a procedure, which makes it really easy to have a procedure handle an event. Let's show an example that demonstrates this behavior. Let's choose option J to investigate raising events. Here, very simply, we're going to create an instance of the file search 5 class and execute its search. Let's look to see what file search 5 looks like. File search 5 is pretty familiar except it has now a public event named file found. It includes a parameter, which is a file info object. Okay. Down when it finds each file, for each file it finds, it's going to raise event, file found, passing in the file that it found. Raise event then will raise the event to whoever happens to be listening. So that's what event and raise event do. Back in our original code, someone needs to be listening for that event or we'll never see anything on the screen. If I scroll up to the top here, I have a bunch of event handlers. Here I have event handler 0 that is handling fs5.filefound. Well, where is fs5 declared? Let's go scroll up a little bit. Here we are. We have here private with events fs5 as file search 5. What does that mean? The with events keyword indicates to Visual Basic that this variable fs5 can react to events of an instance of the file search 5 class, and it can do it using the handles clause on a procedure. So this procedure will be notified when a file search 5 instance named fs5 raises its file found event. So whenever fs5 raises the file found event, this procedure will run and execute its code. Now, this procedure has to be of this exact syntax. It has to be a sub that accepts a file info as a parameter. Where do we specify that? Back in File Search 5, where we defined the event, public event 
file found indicating what's being passed back. That means that if we attempt to here react to that file found event with the incorrect signature, maybe we expect two parameters. I want two parameters. So I'll say x as integer. This code won't compile anymore. It's going to tell me that this event handler cannot handle this event because they don't have the same signature. This is smelling an awful lot like delegates. Does it make sense here in File Search 5 that when we create this event, what we're really doing is defining a delegate type that describes what kind of procedure can react to this event? And here, when we create this event handler that we say handles that event, we are creating an instance of that delegate type. And we want the .NET runtime to notify us by calling this procedure, which we specified as a delegate type, in reaction to the event. And that's exactly what's going on. I'm not making this stuff up. We'll look at ILDASM in a moment to see how that all plays out. For now, let's run the procedure. I run at full speed, and as each file got found, the File Search 5 class raised the event, and our listener here, event handler 0, then displayed in the console window the name of each file it found. OK, well, let's extend this a little bit farther. Let me go on to the next example, multiple handlers, K. Here, I'm going to use File Search 6, that class. It's an exact copy of File Search 5. The only reason I have two different classes is so that I can have a different set of event handlers listing for it without having to modify my code. So File Search 5 and File Search 6 are exactly the same classes except for their names. Okay, we're going to set up our new File Search 6, and in a moment we'll execute. Let's go look at our event handlers. FS6, again, is a variable declared with events as a file search 6 instance. Here, I have event handler 1, and it handles fs6.file found. It handles a couple of other events as well. We'll look at those in a bit. But event handler 1 handles this event. Event handler 2 handles this event. So we have two different procedures handling the event that's raised by FS6. Now, we have no control over how this is all being hooked up in the plumbing underneath. We're just saying we have these two procedures. They're both going to react to the same event. So what happens when we run our code? In this case, we run the code. And you'll see that we got two event handlers running each time a file was found. Now, normally, your two event handlers wouldn't do the same thing. You might have one event handler that handles the file being found a certain way, and another event handler doing something else with it. And you might want to, as you'll see later, you can add or remove those event handlers as needed. One thing to note before we leave this is that you have no control over the order in which these event handlers get called. When the file is found, the File Search 6 class invokes a delegate. Really, that's what's going on. It invokes the delegate. And since you didn't manually create the delegate instance, it wasn't you that added these two event handlers to that multicast delegate. Instead, the .NET runtime plumbing did it. You don't know what order they add them in. It looked like, in this case, they added them in the opposite order they found them in. But I'm pretty sure that if I rearrange the order here, that doesn't affect the outcome of our display. Let's try it. This is multiple handlers K. Let's run it. And they still come out in the exact same order. So it's not the order of the procedures in the file that matters, that's for sure. So just keep this in mind that if you use this mechanism for handling events, that is the handles clause and with events variables, you have no control over the order in which these multiple event handlers are called. We need to see what's going on here. So I'm going to go to my command prompt window here and, again, load this thing up in ILDASM. We need to get, there we are, executable. And let's look and see what's going on. I created within File Search 5 that file found event. Let's go investigate File Search 5 or File Search 6, doesn't matter. We'll find inside File Search 5 a new subclass. Here's a class within File Search 5. 
file found event handler. Huh, where did that come from? File found event handler. It is a class that extends multicast delegate. We've seen this before. I've seen this somewhere before. This is an instance of a delegate type. Where did this delegate type come from? File found event handler. Let's go look. File search five. File found, uh, I don't see it. Where is it? The answer is it's not here. It's a beautiful thing. When you declare an event in your code with a name of, say, file found, the VB compiler automatically creates for you a delegate named file found, and they tack on the words event handler. So we actually have a delegate type named file found event handler. I didn't create it, but it's there, and the comments here describe that for you. The compiler will create this for you, and I can prove that, because if I come along and try to create something with that name, let's take this, just uncomment it, can't do it, because this already exists in the class, an implicitly declared object. All right, so since we didn't create it, and the compiler did, we're not going to see it used in our code, but if we go back to ILDASM, we'll find it used within their compiled code. So here, for example, file found event. Where's that coming from? File found event. Well, that is this instance of the delegate, our event named file found. So they have to create this type for the delegate. They create the delegate, and this becomes an instance of that delegate type described right here. They rename it as file found event. Okay, down here in our code, if we look at the search method, we're going to find, let's see, there's our class, and down here when they find a file, There it is. We found the file found event handler invoke method. So that means every time they find a file, they are invoking the delegate that they created for us in the class. Let's go look again. Here, we raise the event. What that really is, is a call to invoke on a delegate. This whole thing is tied up in, they've hidden the fact that they're using delegates and delegate instances buried underneath the event and raise event keywords. I just thought you'd like to know. I like knowing how these things are working. It certainly explains why event handlers have to match up with a certain specific functional type. Imagine this. You have multiple listeners for the same event. What if one of the event handlers raises an exception? What happens then? So imagine the search method raises event and there are three listeners. Under the covers, this is calling the invoke method of a multicast delegate. The first exception bubbles back out to the caller and no more handlers get called at all. To investigate this, we'll need to look in ILDASM again. There's only one method call for all those handlers, and an exception causes the code to return back to the caller. So we have an alternative. Event raising is convenient, but it's going to be possibly problematic if an exception occurs. There's another alternative. You can call the invoke method of each listener individually, or you can just invoke each listener individually. To do that, you need to call the get invocation list method of the event delegate type. Iterate through those items, invoking each item. I say call invoke, you don't have to call invoke. You can just invoke each item either by calling invoke or specifying the name of the variable. You've seen both techniques. You'll need to trap the exceptions individually for each item you happen to call. This is an advanced technique, that's for sure, but there are times when it will come in handy. Let's look at the bad example and the fixed example. To demonstrate this, I'll choose option L, raise event error, 
And here, we'll be using the File Search 7 class. Let's look at File Search 7. And it still has the event declared here. And it still calls the raise event keyword down here. So it's the same as File Search 5 and 6. In our main procedure, we're going to try calling fs7.execute. And if an exception occurs, and it says here, and it will, just exit quietly. We could display a message, but you'll know when an exception occurs. OK. So what does fs7.execute run? Let's go up to the top and look at our event handlers. We have a with events variable, fs7, here. And we have multiple procedures which are going to handle fs7.file found. Here's one. We'll run two. We'll run event handler one, event handler two, and looks like event handler three. OK, so we have event handler three. And event handler three, rather than writing to the console window what it found, it says it's throwing an exception, and then it just throws an exception. The throw keyword allows me to throw a new exception, which the caller will either handle or not. Remember, the caller in this case is the code right down here. There we are. This is the code that ended up calling that thing. Remember how event handling works. It's actually this code here that calls that procedure. This is actually invoking a delegate instance. So this is the code that's doing the calling. Here we aren't trapping the exception that we get from that. So it bubbles back out to the caller, which is here. This one is catching the exception, and it's going to do nothing at all. OK, let's see what happens. What I expect to have happen when I run this procedure is have each of these event handlers, 2, 1, and 3, react to fs7.file found and display a list of all the files three times. Let's run it. When we run it, what we get is event handler 3 threw an exception, and that's the end of the story. Sorry, we're done. It's funny, it looks like event handler 3 got run before event handler 1 or 2. If it had gotten called last, we would have gotten one file from each of the other two, and then event handler 3 would have thrown exception. But it looks like the .NET runtime decided to run event handler 3 first. It threw an exception. That exception bubbled up, and everything stopped. Well, why is that? If we go back out, well, we've already seen it in ILDASM. You've already seen the fact that in our class, file search 7, this is just a call to a single invoke method. There's only a single invoke method. How can you possibly do anything other than what we just saw? That is, an exception occurs. This code isn't handling it. It bubbles back out to the caller that is. We handle the exception, and we're done. Because that's what throwing an exception does. So we would need to find an alternative solution. And the alternative is here, option M. Here we have the exact same behavior. File search 8 is slightly different. Let's look at file search 8. File search 8 does the same thing as the public event file found. But down here, when it finds a file, it does something different. OK, look at this code. It says, let's dim listener list, that's a variable, as system.delegate, an array of system.delegate types, because that's what this method's going to return. And we have file found event dot get invocation list. There's nothing in our class named file found event, right? Where did that come from? File found event is the name they assign to this instance of the event handling delegate type. So file found event is the name under the covers that the VB compiler creates that corresponds to this event. It'll always be the name of the event followed by the word event. That's what the VB compiler creates for you. Down here in the code, we can call the get invocation list method of that file found event instance. And guess what they hand you? They're like snitching on the listeners. They hand to this code a list of everyone who's hitched at the hitching post to react to this event being raised. So you get information here that you're not supposed to have which is a list of everyone that's listening. Given that list, you can have your own 
try catch block here. So we can say for each file in the list of files we found, for each handler as file found event handler, in my list of listeners, if the handler isn't nothing, and I'm checking for that, I probably don't need to, we can try to invoke the handler. We're manually invoking it. As opposed to using raise event, we're invoking each listener directly. Same exact thing, that's all raise event is. It is an invoke call to a multicast delegate. Here we'll invoke each handler individually. If something goes wrong, we just keep on a going. We don't care. We just disregard the error. This is a tricky technique. Once you figure it out, it's very simple. You're just getting a list of every procedure that's listening for this event and invoking them individually. We're making an end run around the event raising mechanism. It's certainly possible. It's not something you'll do every day, but it may come up and at least now you know how you can do it. If I run this full speed, we'll see that event handler two and one run just fine. Three keeps throwing its exception, but too bad. We're not paying any attention. It can have its fit. We don't care. So this allows us to call each event handler even if one of the event handlers or more of them raises an exception. If you need this sort of behavior, this is invaluable information. If you don't, well, it's just useful and interesting technique. I want to point out one other thing as well. Don't forget that you are actually invoking a procedure when you raise an event. What happens if we go to this code here, if one of these event handlers, and I suggest you don't do this, one of these event handlers does something that blocks the entire application. For example, it stops and waits for a key. This would be a really rude thing to do. We run this. M, run full speed. Dum -de -dum -de -dum. Dum -de -dum -de -dum. Notice that raising events, that is invoking these delegate instances, is synchronous. They have to stop and wait before they can go on any farther. I press the key, and every time I press the key, we'll finally move on a little bit. You see, you really can't have your event listeners do anything that will tie up the application because each event listener runs synchronously. That is, it doesn't run in a background thread. It's some kind of magic that would cause it to not tie up the application. Be aware of this when creating event handlers. You want them to run as quickly as you possibly can. Now, we've been using events so far that don't really match the .NET event design pattern. In .NET, events always use two parameters. There's a sender parameter, which is sent as an object, and that's the object that raised the event. And there's normally a variable named E, which is an event args, or something that inherits from event args. You may have to provide your own class that inherits from event args if you want to provide your own sort of information. And you'll also, in general, provide a protected overridable procedure with the name of on whatever your event name is that actually raises the event. This allows classes that inherit from your class to be able to override your event handling behavior. This is just standard design pattern, and we'll look at how we can modify our class to match up with this standard design pattern. To demonstrate the .NET event design pattern, I'll choose option N here, and now we'll be using the file search 9 class. File search 9 is different than the previous classes because this one does things a little bit differently. This one shows off a couple of different things. First of all, you have the right, if you want, to create your own delegate type defining your event. Now here, I created a delegate type named file found event handler. And because I'm using this mechanism, the VB compiler won't create it for me. Now you don't have to do this. You can do it just like you might have thought. That is, create a public event named file found and define the parameters here. That is sender as object, E as file found event args. We'll talk more about that in a second. 
Or you could create a delegate type here, which describes the procedure, sender as object, es firefun event arg sub. We have a delegate that defines that type of procedure. And you can make an event, public event file found, as that type. That's what's going on when you write this code. The VB compiler then does this for you if you don't do it yourself. If you use this delegate based type like I've done here, then you can have another event of the same type. This is how the .NET framework works. They create delegate types that define events that they'll want to raise, and then they create events of those types. Rather than creating each individual, well, they can't. There's no way to do this. This is a VB6 only construct that they've covered up and made easy for you, but under the covers, they're doing it the .NET way, which is this way. So either way works fine. You can write it all yourself, or you can let the VB compiler do it for you. In this example, I showed the way you could do it yourself. What is this file found event args thing? Well, that's over here. File found event args is a class I've created which inherits from the event args class. Remember, the second parameter of every event you create should be of a type that is event args or inherits from event args. In this case, I have a private variable which keeps track of the file that was found. I have a constructor which allows you to pass in a file info and it gets stored into that private variable. And we have a public read-only property which allows you to retrieve that file info object. The consumer of the event will do this. The raiser of the event, the code that raises the event, will do this. All right, well, let's go back and look at our code in File Search 9. In File Search 9, when you find a file, here we go, every time we find a file, we're going to call the onFileFound procedure, passing in the file info object we found. On file found is here. It's protected, overridable. Protected means the procedure is visible to this class and any class that inherits from it. Overridable means you can override this procedure in a class that inherits from this one. So if you don't like or don't want to use the event handling mechanism this class provides, you can always just override it and change the behavior. If we hadn't done this mechanism, we wouldn't be able to override the event handling mechanism. On file found, this name is just a convention. On and the name of the event. Nothing makes you do that. The parameter in this case is a file info object because that's what we need to raise our event. Inside here, we raise the event. Here's the name of the event. And remember, all that's doing really is invoking the event variable delegate. We pass in the object that raised the event, that's me in this case, and a new instance of our file found event args class passing in the file that was found. So we raise this event with two parameters. The listener for the event had better be of the same type expecting to receive two parameters. If we go back out to our module and look at our code, we must have somebody, we're in the constructor for FS9, let's keep going here, Somebody had better be listening for this event. We're not going to see anything. Let's scroll up here again. There we are. FS9 underscore file found handles the file found event. And this event handler is of the correct delegate type. It receives a sender as the first parameter, E as file found event args as the second parameter, because that's what we're raising from the event. And here in our code, we'll display e.filefound that is the file that was found, we will get its full name property and display it in the console window. So this event handler matches other event handlers in the .NET runtime. Every event in .NET looks something like this. Let's let it rip by pressing F5. You see the results you expect, and there's no surprises. So we've covered just about every detail about working with events and delegates in .NET. There's only one last issue, and that is handling events dynamically. All code you've seen so far uses event handlers that are hooked up at design time. What if you want to dynamically control event listeners? 
To do that, you can use the add handler and remove handler statements. This gives you complete control over the order of calling event listeners because they're called in the order you add them. Add handler and remove handler count on a delegate describing the event handler and an incorrect signature will cause your code not to compile. Let's try out these add handler and remove handler statements. I'll select option O to try out the add and remove handler statements here and you'll see that we're using file search 9 still. Here's our constructor for FS9. There we go. And now I'll use the add handler statement. It says I'd like to react to the file found event of the variable fs. See the local variable fs is defined here. We're not using the with event statement at all. Add handler fs.file found address of event handler 6. Let's look at event handler 6. Here it is. It seems to be the right syntax as is 5 and 4. So they all have the correct syntax for handling this event. So down in our code again, we'll add a handler for event handler 6, then 5, then 4, and now we'll execute the search. When we execute the search, it will raise the event, and each of those handlers will listen for the event. And notice the order in which things appeared, 6, then 5, then 4. Because we added them ourselves using add handler, we're guaranteed they run in that order. Now I can remove an event handler. I'm going to remove from the list of event handlers the address of event handler 6. That will remove it from the list of delegates to invoke. This is all just multicast delegates, right? We're removing one of the delegate instances from the list of delegates, or in this case, removing a handler. And now there are two event listeners. If we execute again, this time, you'll see that we get just 5, 4, 5, 4, 5, 4, 5, 4, and so on in this chunk here. Now, although you don't have to remove event handlers because FS is going out of scope at this point, if FS wasn't going out of scope and you wanted to make sure that you didn't get event handling happening anymore, you could remove everything. But just to show how you could, I'm going to remove all the event handlers, and of course now FS goes out of scope. So don't think you have to manually remove handlers you add. You only have to if the variable that's raising the events doesn't go out of scope at the end of the procedure. In any case, you've now seen how to add and remove event handlers dynamically. You already knew how to handle them statically at compile time, but now you can add and remove event handlers at will at runtime.